Hello, um, so is Arlo here? Uh, okay, I think according to the schedule I have 12 minutes to do this talk. So <laughs> no, 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 I, I took the time, so you... Okay, should I, okay, well, recognizing that I'm standing between you and lunch, I will try to go as quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll be talking about time frequency measures. Okay. So, um, right. This will be a pretty, pretty basic introduction, but it'll try to go through the various, uh, you know, data representations that are available in EG Lab. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to reiterate about this P41 and, and clarify a little bit. Um, it's a, it's a grant that will allow us to connect with um, people doing primarily clinical work. Um, we're especially looking for people who have active grants, particularly NIH grants. The idea is to give us a grant to help people with other grants improve, you know, expand their, their scope. Um, and again, there's this site, uh, this uh, survey, uh, if you are kind of fall, fit in this criteria, please fill that out. Um, and then uh, finally, there are some dinner sign-up sheets uh, out at the registration table. Um, three of those dinners will have this P41 emphasis. So we're looking for people interested in maximizing information from clinical work. That'll be with Scott Makoto. Um, people interested in experiment design and large-scale statistics, large-scale data sets, Arno and Serial. And then people interested in using mobile brain imaging, MOBI. Um, I'll be leading that one. So if, you know, this is really for people who are, are, are you know, seriously interested in, in a kind of deeper collaboration with us as part of the P41. There's also three other um, groups. There's the EEG Lab mailing list one. So for all of those who've ever participated or read Makoto's awesome answers, you can finally meet him in person. And then there'll be a SIF uh, dinner and a BCI dinner, which came in Christian. Okay. So, you know, our signals of interest, obviously, in this, this, this workshop are uh, MEG and EEG, primarily EEG, I guess, for most of us. Um, and, y you know, we want to describe dynamic characteristics of brain activity and relationship between different areas of the brain. Uh, so traditionally, there are you know, various approaches to doing that. We can ask, uh, answer these questions in the time domain. We can look in the frequency domain or the, the time frequency <laughs> domain. So I'll be focusing on, on the latter. Uh, we all know that, uh, you know, EEG can be described in terms of different frequency bands of oscillatory activity to which are given different meanings. Um, we can look at spectrum of, um, you know, like a given channel or a component of EEG, and we see overall, um, you know, that there's different amounts of energy in different, different frequencies. Uh, this is a completely static view, though. It's telling us sort of, you know, for a given period of time, what is the amount of different frequencies. And uh, as, you know, Scott showed before, there's clearly lots of time-varying power in different frequencies in the EG signal. Um, so the spectrum itself is, is not, uh, it's just a very gross description, but it doesn't capture time-varying aspects. So that's where we'll get into time frequency transforms. So a bit of historical perspective. Um, you know, a lot of these techniques are based on Fourier analysis, um, which in its sort of simplest form just gives you a, a spectral profile of a signal. Um, it's been sort of elaborated to give time varying uh, frequency information um, through two methods, short time Fourier transform or more recently uh, multi-resolution wavelet transforms. And I'll talk about both of those. So here's the plan. Um, talk briefly about frequency analysis, time frequency analysis, and coherence analysis. So frequency analysis, uh, you know, the simplest goal is what frequency are, are present in the signal and how much energy is present for each frequency. Um, there are a couple of considerations that I will just go through very briefly and actually not at all, um, or just very briefly, um, amplitude and phase and windowing. There's actually more information in the, the slides that you can download, kind of a couple of bonus slides that I took out of this one that go into more detail, but I'll at least touch on those. So, um, you know, at base we have Fourier analysis. Um, the insight um, of Fourier is that you can describe any arbitrary signal as a sum of sinusoids, okay? Um, for example, this signal here could be decomposed into a series of sinusoids, 
um, of different frequency and different phase. But by adding them together, we can gradually uh, and, and more and more accurately approximate any arbitrary signal. Um, if we look just at the amplitude of these sinusoids, um, that's what we get when we look at a power spectrum. Um, but the actual Fourier transform here is, is a continuous time, and there's also a discrete time Fourier transform that is done, say, in, by the FFT command in MATLAB. Um, the, the key is that the results, these coefficients that come out of the analysis are complex values, so they actually give us an amplitude and a phase for every frequency that's been analyzed. Um, that's often kind of buried in the fact that we look at, at power spectrum mostly, um, so just keep that in mind. So um, to describe the frequency, why not just take our signal and do an FFT? Um, it seems like a good idea. You'd get amazing frequency resolution. So the frequency resolution of the FFT is one over the duration of the signal, okay? Um, so if we had a 100-second signal, we could have 0.1 hertz resolution. Um, but we, do we really need such resolution, given the scale of EEG? No. Uh, there's also a big disadvantage of doing this, that the Fourier transform suffers from bias and variance. So um, typically, uh, in MATLAB, you'll find a solution is using one of various, various things, like a Welsh's method, which basically takes many short windows of the signal, does a Fourier transform of each short window, and then averages those together. Um, so that, that solves some of those. And then, but what I really want to talk about is the, the lack of temporal resolution. So the first solution would be a short-term Fourier transform. Um, here the idea, again, is to take uh, short windows of signal uh, do a Fourier transform of each of those windows. So you're basically taking a, a snapshot in time and saying, okay, what's the power spectrum for that window? And, that, and then we can slide that window along the signal to, to visualize time-bearing frequency content. Um, and we'll get to this disadvantage uh, in a little bit, but um, I'll, I'll explain that. So here, kind of graphically, here's what you see. Uh, signal, um, this blue box is the sliding window. And... Um, <coughs> So uh, we can analyze that window um, at, at a variety of frequencies. Um, what I won't really get into in great detail here is that we typically don't just take the signal in the window and, and analyze it. We'll, we'll typically um, multiply it by a tapering function, so we smooth off the edges of the window. Um, and the main reasons for that have to do with um, um, basically avoiding um, spectral smearing, which is what you get with a rectangular window. And there's some slides, more detailed slides, in the handout on that, that topic. Um, but just the basic concept is what I want to get across here, um, that we're doing windowed sinusoid. Um, and so we can analyze each window at, at a variety of frequencies. Um, and again, the result for each frequency is a complex valued number. Um, it can be represented as a phaser. Um, you'll remember that complex values have a, you know, a, a real and an imaginary part where you can plot that on a, a 2D plot. Um, but you can also express the, um, those as an amplitude times a phase. Which is this formula here. So if you kind of conceptualize each coefficient of the analysis as being this little phaser diagram, the length of the arrow is the amplitude of that given frequency, and then the, the, the phase of that arrow, which direction it's pointing, represents the phase uh, of the signal at that frequency. So um, if we do that over a series of sliding windows, um, represented here with time going along the x-axis, uh, for each window we get a, a complex number for each uh, frequency band that we analyze, here 5 to 30 hertz. Okay. So you can kind of think of this as basically it's a, it's a two-dimensional complex value matrix. Um, what we typically do in EEG, in event-related analyses, is to do this spectrogram for each, um, each window that we've taken from whatever our event of interest is. So we can imagine a stack of those um, spectrograms. Okay. Um, and to actually compute what we think of as the spectrogram, we'll just average across those. Um, so um, th there are two ways to do that. Um, the typical way is to actually average the magnitudes of those, okay, so throw out the phase information. Um, and then you get um, a spectrogram like this. Okay. So just a little bit more on amplitude and phase. So the power spectra describes the amount of frequency present, um, but that is not a complete description. We, you know, also need to know the phase. Um, 
So all these frequency domain techniques return an amplitude and phase at each time and frequency. Um, and again, to find power, we compute the magnitude, which discards phase. I, I'm just reiterating this because it's a, an issue that I find um, some people beginning frequency analysis don't quite appreciate that underlying the plots that we show in EEG lab, there's actually this complex valued representation. Um, I think in the spirit of EEG lab, which is to like throw out as little information as possible, the, the philosophy like doing an ERP, you're getting rid of lots of interesting brain processes. Well, just, just keep that in mind that looking at a power spectrum, you're actually ignoring part of the information. Um, there's just one other a concept that relates to windowing, um, which is uh, that of time frequency uncertainty. Okay, so uh, in theory, if we wanted to look at a spectrogram, we want to know how much power there is at each moment of time at each frequency. Well, you know, ideally we could have, you know, very focal resolution in time and frequency, so we could say, you know, differentiate the amount of power in one hertz versus two hertz, and you know, at, at 100 milliseconds, 101 milliseconds. Well, in reality, um, you can't uh, have arbitrarily you know, precise resolution in both frequency and time at the same time. Um, and this is often formulated in, in terms like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, um, but it's in terms of the basically the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of focus that you can make on the time domain and the frequency domain. Um, the product of those is, is limited. Okay. So what that means in practice is that um, this is kind of interact with like the window size that you picked for your analysis. Okay, so a longer window um, will get you finer frequency resolution, but because you're doing a longer window, you're going to get uh, poorer time resolution. Okay, and vice versa. A narrow window will give you a good time resolution with poor frequency resolution. Um, so schematically, this is something shown here. Um, these would be sort of schematic spectrograms. Uh, short windows, you can get many more of them per given unit of time, but you have worse frequency resolution and vice versa. Okay, and just to show that, um, this is a, a series of signals at, from 10, 25, 50, and 100 hertz that just um, each play for four seconds, okay? Um, so with a very short window, um, window of 25 milliseconds, you can actually resolve individual cycles of the 10 hertz um, stimulus. So that's, that's fantastic. You find temporal resolution, but frequency resolution is very, um, very broad. You can see here, it's very hard, you can, hard to localize what the frequency is um, at 100 hertz. But as you um, increase the window size, you can see progressively through 125, 375, and, and one second, um, <coughs> you can see that the, um, well, the temporal resolution gets worse, the frequency resolution sharpens up. Um, in this case, it's a little hard to see the worsening of temporal resolution. You might say, well, this looks fine. Um, but if you, if you were able to focus in on these transition points, you'd see that there's quite a bit of, of blurring of that transition. These are actually very long signals, so it doesn't show up as clearly. So um, one... Uh, criticism of the short time Fourier transform is that you're essentially looking at, w at a given window length and you're analyzing all the frequencies, okay? So it means you're analyzing low frequencies with the window length of, of a second. Um, if you're, say, looking at uh, five hertz, that would be five cycles, you know? Um, but you're also analyzing uh, 100 hertz with a window of one second. So you actually have 100 cycles, okay? So something physically doesn't seem quite right there. So the idea that, well, you know, 100 cycles of 100 hertz, that's a long time for that frequency, right? It's oscillated many for a long time. So the sense that um, maybe there's a different time scale might be relevant for different frequencies. Um, and the wavelet transform is um, kind of uh, designed to follow that intuition. Um, the idea being that, well, why don't we just vary the window size with frequency? Um, so that we have longer windows for low frequencies and shorter windows for higher frequencies. Uh, the idea there being that, okay, you know, there's a characteristic sort of scale of each frequency, and we're looking at that characteristic scale. So in the kind of extreme case, we can compare our analysis windows like this. Um, uh, on the left side of the screen is what we would see for a Fourier transform, a short-time Fourier transform. 
Um, this would be our, our window length and our tapered um, <coughs> windowing function. So you can see that um, the window length is the same across all frequencies. So again, exemplifying, we have a few cycles of this low frequency, but many, many cycles of the high frequency. Well, the pure wavelet transform actually um, uses the exact same waveform, but uh, so the exact same number of cycles for each frequency. So naturally, the waveform gets shorter and shorter as we go to higher frequencies. Okay, so it's a constant number of cycles, um, and so the window gets shorter at high frequencies. And so contrasting that, um, what you can see that an FFT versus a wavelet, the same stimulus. Um, as you go, this is, this is planted with low frequencies up top and high frequencies at the bottom, but you can see clearly that the wavelet um, at the higher frequencies has much finer time resolution. You can see these um, individually striated um, bursts of energy at high frequencies, whereas that's all blurred out in the FFT, the short time Fourier transform. Okay. So with these kind of preliminaries out of the way, um, EG Lab typically uses wavelet transforms for all of its time frequency analyses. Um, you, can, you can use parameters that would give you a traditional short time Fourier transform, but in general, as I'll explain in a second, it uses wavelet transforms, that, so it varies the, the time window according to frequency. So there are a couple um, uh, basic uh, um, you know, approaches to time frequency analysis in EG Lab. So the first is the Earth event-related spectral perturbation, okay, uh, which is simply the change in power in different frequency bands relative to a baseline. Um, the <clears throat> really nice uh, figure uh, from one of Scott's papers that shows um, this three-dimensional space that involves um, spectral changes um, at different frequencies, but then also changes in uh, intertrial coherence, which I'll get to. Um, so Earth looks at this, this level here, where we're just looking at pure power changes at different frequencies. Um, if you want to try it out, so in EG Lab, plot time frequency transforms, component time frequency. Um, this is not a practicum, but there's actually a little more detail about you know, values you would enter into the GUI in, in the handout. <coughs> so uh, here's an event-related spectrogram. So this is what we talked about before. Um, this shows the time-varying amount of power in different bands. Okay. Uh, what the Earth does is simply it takes a baseline period, typically negative latency, so the times before the event of interest, um, and it, you know, quote unquote, subtracts that out from the, from the whole um, spectrogram. So that gives us spectral change. So it's saying, okay, um, there was these various amounts of power in the baseline. Um, we subtract those out so that we get more or less an even baseline. And then here, this shows us changes. So it means that at 20 hertz, there's less power following the event. Um, <clears throat> at 5 hertz, there's more power following the event. Um, and that's, that's computed typically, um, for example, here, just basically taking the spectrogram at each uh, time and frequency divided by the baseline. The baseline is computed per frequency. And we say, you know, subtract it out because we're typically um, looking at this in, in dB scale, so a log 10 scale, so you know, a, a ratio uh, is a subtraction in, the, in logarithmic space. Um, the baseline is subtracted and we see event-related changes in power, and that's reflected in the units. Um, this is units of power, and the Earth is in units typically of decibels, okay? So again, it's log transforms, so it's looking at um, changes in power. Okay. Um, one, one little practical thing, in, in these time frequency transforms, I think this is the, the parameter that confuses the most beginners. Um, there are two numbers that you specify for the wavelet cycles. Um, and so um, the first number is the number of cycles in the wavelet, in sort of the basic wavelet. Um, and the second number is the um, extent to which um, the time window is shortened uh, with increasing frequency. So um, 3-0 would be a an FFT or short time Fourier transform where there's no no shortening of the windows. That's what I showed you before. Three one would be the pure wavelet, saying that basically um, uh, the windows are, are going to have the exact same number of cycles, so they'll shrink a lot as you go up. Um, typical default in EG Lab is three point five, so it's some, somewhat intermediate between these. So it says basically we're going to compromise um, 
will reduce the high frequency time resolution a bit to gain more frequency resolution at higher frequencies. Okay, so you can see that these reduce in, in length, but not, not as much as in the wavelet. Okay, so um, I, I mentioned, you know, that's, that's the Earth, but then we also have this concept of coherence. Um, and in that plot, there was the vertical axis was ITC, or intertrial coherence. Um, I, many of you are familiar with this, but I'll just go through um, in, in some, some detail. So the goal of coherence is really to just answer the question, how much the two signals resemble one another? Um, it's, it's a simple concept. It's really just a complex value, a complex version of correlation. So how similar are the power and phase at each frequency? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and a variant which um, you've probably come across is phase coherence, so-called phase locking, um, which only looks at how similar are the phases of the two signals, ignoring the power. Okay, so you can really think of regular coherence being a power-weighted version of phase coherence, where you care about the power of the two signals. So um, the the basic formula for coherence is is basically the spectrogram for any given frequency of time of signal one times the con complex conjugate of the spectrogram of signal two. Um, and so, um, kind of this conceptually speaking, this is we're just multiplying two complex numbers. And as you know, so if we have this representation of, of amplitude and phase, multiplying those numbers um, gives us something that has um, product of the amplitudes, but with, with respect to phase, it actually looks at the phase difference between the two. Okay. Um, so we can think of each, um, each Fourier coefficient or wavelet coefficient as a phase or vector, okay, with a length and a phase. Uh, this would be for two signals. Uh, and then these could be the different time points. So really what we're looking at, looking at is the amplitude-weighted phase difference between the two signals. Um, and if we plot up all of those phase differences um, on this, this um, compass plot, um, we can see that they're all... Uh, you know, have different lengths and different angles, but if we look at the sum of those, we get this little green arrow there, and that's what coherence is, just the sum of those phase differences. Um, and the difference between regular coherence and, and you know, um, pure phase coherence is whether you've just normalized these vectors to, to one before doing, um, doing the calculation. So we use coherence in two main ways uh, in EEG lab. So the first is intertrial coherence, which is now we're not actually looking at the relationship between two different signals in the brain or two different sources in the brain. We're looking at the relationship of responses of a single source over time. Okay. So intertrial means between you know, between trials, but where trials are, you know, for example, in a stimulus-evoked response, you know, you play a sound and you look at a trial. So the question is, well, how how consistent is the response? Um, stimulus after stimulus. And Scott showed you something before with the P3 that showed, well, it's you know, fairly, fairly similar, but there are differences. So we'll go into that in a little more detail. Um, so the phase ITC. So it's um, basically looking at, um, similar, to the, um, um, similar to the coherence, but we're basically taking the normalized uh, frequency coefficients. So we're getting rid of the amplitude and phase, and we're adding those up across trials. So for example, if these were three trials, um, they have different amplitudes and different phases. Uh, we're just going to look at the phase, and we just add those up, so we get a, a resultant phase vector. Now, so clearly, if these phases are all aligned with each other, if we add them up, take their average, we'll get a large resultant. Um, if they're all pointed in random directions, and we add them up, we'll get zero. Okay, that's the, the intuition there. So here's an example um, for three trials. Uh, let's look on the left here. So with these three single trials, um, in, in this case, they all show a, a burst of energy, but you can see that the phases of the red, green, and, and blue curves are not aligned. Okay. Um, contrast that with this case on the right, where you see the same increase in power, but the phases are aligned. Well. You know, point one is that um, the ERP cares about phase alignment. Okay, so when the phases are not aligned, we don't get a large ERP. When the phases are aligned, we get a large ERP. Um, 
The, the earth, however, is, like I said before, it's kind of phase blind. Um, this is sometimes called the induced response, the induced power, um, where we just care about the, the power of each of these. We don't care about the phase. So you can see those are actually identical between these two. Um, and then finally, if we look at the intertrial coherence, it's low in this case because um, all the phases are different, but it's higher in this case because the phases are quite similar. So moving back to this diagram, um, <clears throat> we see this, this vertical ITC axis here. Um, so it gives us a way to think about how ERPs actually arise and then therefore what does an ERP mean about what's going on in the brain. Okay. Um, and so there are two kind of main ways you can get an ERP. Um, first is that um, you just simply have an increase in intertrial coherence. Um, and even with no change in power, uh, you can get an ERP. And that's this, this vertical range here. Um, or you can have change both in intertrial coherence and power. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that, um, but just keeping those in mind. So if you're seeing an ERP, you can't actually tell from that whether which of these processes generated it. Was it phase, phase resetting? Was it change in power? Or was it both? Um, and what Scott and, and Arno have developed in the EG lab are methods for actually teasing those two things apart based on something called the ERP image. Okay, so let's take an example. Um, this would be multiple trials of a given, uh, given process with an event. Okay. Um, if we look, look across time, we can see that there are regions where um, the phases are not aligned, but then there are times when the phases are generally aligned across trials. Okay. So if we generate, uh, simulate a lot of trials, five minutes, thank you generate a lot of trials, um, we can represent those in what's called an ERP image. And Scott mentioned this, but it's very simply, each trial is now a row of this, this color matrix. Um, the color indicates the amplitude of each trial. Okay, so you can think of this, each, each row is like a waveform, um, but, but we're just color coding the peaks with red and the troughs with blue. Um, and typically in the ERP image, there's some smoothing across trials to make these bands of color um, stand out more. What we can clearly see here is that before the stimulus, um, the phases are completely random. Um, after the stimulus, we see these stripes indicating that the phase has aligned across trials. It gives us a, a big ERP. Um, but the actual amount of color hasn't changed. So um, if we look at, if we were to look at an Earth, we wouldn't see any power change. Um, but if we look at this ITC value, of intertrial coherence, we see a peak of intertrial coherence. Okay, so this is an ERP that is um, arising only from phase resetting or phase alignment across trials. Okay, in contrast, I think what people often think of as an ERP involves power change. Um, so this is another example of an ERP image. Now it's been sorted according to the phase um, following the stimulus. So you see these diagonal bands. What you see before the stimulus is that um, the phase is basically random. Um, this, this diagonal stripe. After the stimulus, the phase isn't, isn't quite completely vertically aligned, but it's more closer to vertical. Um, so summing up across those trials, that, that intertrial coherence is what results in an ERP. Um, we can also see that the colors are, are deeper and darker uh, at this time than they were before. Okay, so again, we have um, a combination of things going on here. So the ERP is created by intertrial coherence, which increases, uh, but there's also a measurable increase in power. Okay. So again, this is just multiple views of the same data. Okay. And, and I think that's one thing that EG Lab is particularly um, rich in and focuses on, um, all these views of the same ERP. Um, and you can see also that it gives you more information in that uh, for the Earth, there's actually this period of lower uh, lower power, um, which really doesn't show up in the ERP at all. Okay, so putting it all together, um, the display in EEG lab, um, when you do this time frequency, it will show an ERSP on top and then an ITC spectrogram on the bottom. Okay, this is kind of a slightly different new thing, um, but basically it's just the intertrial coherence at different frequency bands. Okay, 
So in interpreting these, we can take any, any, any uh, event-related process and look to say, okay, well, how did power change following the event, and how did the intertrial coherence change? So this is a very uh, powerful way of looking at it. So uh, just briefly to finish up, we can also look at coherence um, between two different signals. So looking at the relationship between signals. Um, and this is you know, clearly a, a huge area in what we want to understand. We want to understand how different regions of the brain are working together, how they relate to each other. But the concept is exactly the same when it comes to coherence. We're just looking for phase and amplitude alignment between processes. Um, and that's, that's simply down here between uh, component set component time frequency, component cross coherence. So an example here of two um, simulated data processes. Um, at some time they're not aligned, but at other times they are aligned in phase. Okay. So um, you know, choosing the EG lab uh, plotting option, we get two plots. The event-related coherence plot um, is the first one. Here frequency is um, low at top. And so what this shows is that there, at the low frequencies, there's a big increase in event-related coherence um, between these two signals. Okay, so it means basically that the phase around 5 hertz has aligned following the stimulus. Um, it also uh, shows you the actual value of the phase. So the phase doesn't have to be identical for coherence to give you a strong result. All it means is the phase difference has to be consistent, if you think back to that earlier plot I showed. So we're not asking are the stimuli the same, we're just asking is the phase relationship between them stable. Um, so this is kind of, uh, a, you know, coherence is just one way of, of looking at the relationship between signals. Um, if you're interested in this topic, go to Tim Mullen's fifth lectures, because that actually shows a lot more about uh, methods that we can use to examine relationships between multiple sources in the brain. Um, and so uh, one way of looking at this is to, to basically um, each of these balls is a different source. And so the, the links between them tell us something about the relationship between signals. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, this is really just kind of the beginning. These are, are, are kind of, um, I wouldn't say antiquated methods, they're, they're well worn, but um, an issue with coherence, there, there are a number of issues with coherence. Um, it's not the greatest method. First of all, um, looking at coherence between channels rather than sources is a bad idea because we have so much mixing at the channel level. So a lot of coherence is spurious, it's just because of the, the volume conduction. Um, the other thing with coherence, it doesn't tell us anything about directionality. It just shows that, okay, the phase of these two signals is aligned, but we don't know well, which signal is controlling the other. We have no idea. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, um, coherence and actually other methods are, are terribly sensitive to a common input problem, that two signals might look related and you might then assume that they're talking to each other. Well, if they just simply have the same common input, that relationship is spurious. There may be no connection between those two signals, it's just that they're reflecting the same common input. Um, and so Tim will go into great length about these issues and how they've been solved by more um, modern techniques using autoregressive modeling. Um, Granger causality is probably something you've heard of. That's one, one method. That actually just has just as many problems as coherence when it comes to common input. Um, but it does give you directionality. But there are more advanced methods that Tim will talk about um, that try to solve both of these issues. And finally, also this has all been sort of um, looking at kind of frequency bands um, in isolation. There are many cross-frequency methods now. Um, and so one that we, we will talk about um, on Sunday is phase amplitude coupling, where you look at the relationship between the phase of one frequency and the amplitude of another. So Ramon will be talking about a new plug-in for that. So um, just I'll finish up there. This is just a, a very brief overview of the sort of fundamental time frequency displays in EEG lab. Um, but just keep in mind that there are many other advanced ways of looking at it that you can look at, uh, that you can go learn more about during the, the workshop. Are there any questions? Besides, when is lunch? <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. Why is actually uh, the use of power so common instead of just magnitude? So why, why do we square the, the magnitude? Because we usually bias towards 
kind of in our instruments of the signals was then in spectrum, right? Especially for data collection. Why is this so kind of common? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, Power basically is, has typically been used to just the analog of variance. So you're really asking why are we looking at variance rather than standard deviation. Um, it's the same thing. Power is like, it's like the variance um, of a signal. The, the calculation of power is exactly the same. So, um, you know, why? Generally because um, the squaring makes it sort of, sci you know, it just gives you a positive quantity. So it's the amount of signal, okay? So you're absolutely right. So if power is a squared quantity, it's positive. How can we look at reductions of power? Um, and <clears throat> so just going back to um, this figure here, um, the way you do that is by um, taking a ratio, actually. So your ratio of powers. Um, and, and so with a ratio of powers, you can look at increases and decreases. The problem with ratios is that an increase, you know, can be anything from one to infinity, but decreases are between one and zero. Um, so that's not good. So that's typically why we use decibel scales, okay? Because if you take a log of a ratio, now um, increases are from zero to infinity and decreases are from zero to negative infinity. So we've taken that asymmetry in power between increases and decreases and made it symmetrical, okay? <coughs> Yes. I mean, I originally made that decision to make that default. It's also, you probably still have to figure out the quality of the That the, let's say, what you're basically saying is something increases your theta wave in there and decreases your alpha wave. Are those additive influences? Are you adding theta wave and subtracting alpha wave? Thanks for that. So that's basically saying why are we doing a ratio of powers rather than just subtracting off the baseline, like you, you're typically doing the LP. Um, so hopefully that, that helps. Um, you can play with the different options in, in the GUI. We can talk about that later, too. Any other questions? Okay, I'm being told to wrap up. So uh, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, you know. Feel free to, you know, grab us at any time to ask questions that you might think of later. So actually we have